Firstly, on setup. Secondly, on why this is the most appropriate and only way to deal with climate change. Thirdly, on FPC. Fourthly, on why this is unlikely to be used improperly. We think that this policy looks like censoring climate uh, change denial in public. We think it looks like having really hard emissions targets. We think it looks like uh, exerting direct influence in industry, for instance, setting a limit. Uh, uh, setting limits on the fossil fuel industry, it looks like uh, the government uh, intervening in ways that wouldn't normally to build up the renewable energy sector. We think it looks like policies that ration resources. And we think that there are two clear imperatives the government has to use. The first is its obligations uh, to people because climate change is obviously an existential risk. And secondly, its obligations to animals because we think that animal life is also important and preventing xenocide is also an important imperative and we need to act. Uh, both in the sense that it is important to preserve life and in the sense that destroying and altering natural habitats is obviously very bad for human life. So why is this the most appropriate and only way to deal with climate change? There are a few reasons why we can't get meaningful action on climate change without the use of these powers. Firstly, we think that climate change is perceived to be a long-term issue, which means that uh, come you know, at election time, voters are likely to be a bit optimistic and just think it's something that for tomorrow uh, and or for next year. Secondly, we think that insofar uh, uh, we think that insofar as governments are you know there for say four years runs, we think that they have no incentive to do policies that obviously have uh, harms and trade-offs that are felt in the short term and benefits that are felt uh, far in the long term, meaning that the benefits of those policies won't necessarily be attributed to them. Thirdly, we think that it's hard, you know, it is quite hard to pin down blame pollution so everyone can just play up past the hot potato game. Fourthly, we think that the, uh, the way that like markets function is such that the negative externalities of pollution are not adequately dealt with by market mechanisms. So it's not something that the market can just, you know, it's not like a risk that the market can just, you know, has ways uh, to adapt to. The invisible hand is not going to be to this. Fifthly, we think that uh, climate change consists of a set of collective action problems uh, that stop uh, countries acting in that all country, no country wants climate change. It's bad for everyone, but uh, individual countries have an incentive or a, you know, not to be the first one to act. We know that that incentive applies particularly strongly to developing countries uh, who are, I guess, uh, more coerced by the way global trade and commerce works to retain uh, you know, the business uh, of certain corporations that come and operate there. Sixthly, we think that democracy is a game of balance and interest, and so democracy in normal times it's very hard to get radical changes because we are going to have to make sacrifices and those sacrifices are going to be worth it in the long term and there are things we can do to you know, uh, soften uh, the effects of those sacrifices but we're not going to be able to do those policies uh, with the way things are now. And the seventh reason why uh, is that we think that you know, the way information is distributed, uh, it's kind of just hard, uh, in echo chambers, it's hard to get uh, you know, mass uh, electoral action out of at, at election time. It's hard to go away. I'll take a point from closing. Yeah, sure. Uh, none of these things seem like things you have to do, uh, this sort of policy to have in action. Indeed, it just seems like you just need to convince the middle of the people. Why do you not think people should matter in democracy? People absolutely do matter, which is the exact reason why we would do this policy. We just recognize that there are elements of our political system that make it quite hard to get the demand that we need at election time, that make it quite hard to really influence corporations. We think we are recognizing what is in people interest and just saying uh, we will alter elements of our political system to get there. So why is this effective? Firstly, we think that it solves uh, those large collective action problems. We think uh, that uh, we think that binding, in, we think that international treaties, like for instance the Paris Agreement, are just more likely, most uh, quite likely to happen uh, in, in our world. Um, and right now, countries aren't really you know, sticking to the targets that they set in international treaties because they are subject uh, to, to domestic pressures. Secondly, we think that when countries can seize assets uh, you know, of the big uh, corporate polluters, you know, that is something that they can do. And the alternative would be you know, trying to hold them accountable to environmental legislation in the courts, which would never work because those corporations can run those countries right and leave the courts. Thirdly, we think that uh, we think this now creates an, a radical incentive for corporations to be innovative and become great because the very threat of these emergency powers it being exercised is enough to change the calculus of that corporation because the people running it have 
your obligations to keep that business alive and to produce profit. Fourthly, we think this just heightens the imper imperative to act. We think that this is kind of analogous to like recession. When people say there's going to be a, a recession, people start acting like it is. If we say that this is an emergency, uh, you know, and you know, it's kind of warlike, people are going to start acting with the kind of urgency that we should be acting with. We also think that the dispersive effect is such that you know, uh, if you see someone wasting a lot of resources, you're likely to say, hey, that's not a good thing to do. We think we're stop what's being so wasteful with the resources. Fifthly, we think that there is going to be strong and clear state messaging to explain these policies and why they are necessary and that incentive doesn't really exist at status quo when we are business as usual. And now I'm going to speak, uh, I'll take another I'll take a point from Opie. Sure. Um, if crime was incredibly high in jurisdiction, would you support a similar set of policies to tackle high crime? Crime is a crime of change. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that's my answer to that here. <laughs> so why is it unlikely that this policy be used in properly? Three reasons. Firstly, we think that the imperative to act is so, so big that kind of no action that significantly reduces emissions or harm to the environment is a bad action. Secondly, we think uh, that uh, uh, we think that what this really looks like is just governments doing the kind of policy actions that are necessary for them to meet ambitious, uh, you know, international to meet their obligations under international treaties. Those international treaties are, are likely to have been diligently constructed, and countries are held accountable by other countries. Uh, so we think that the framework in which countries are using, uh, the framework in which countries are operating and using these policies to achieve is one that is likely to be good uh, and not, you, you know, uh, you know, it, it's just a good framework and a good direction. Thirdly, we think that governments have incentives to be seen as legitimate. They don't want their people really angry with them. That still applies in our world, and that is likely to moderate the uh, uh, actions of government in a way that means that these powers are not likely to be used improperly. Climate change is a huge threat. We're not addressing it. We're proud to have done. A very obvious problem with government pensions today is all they do is give the governments more power. You need to believe this policy to work, that people do not care about fixing the problem of climate change right now, which is why things aren't happening but that for some reason, elected leaders really care about fixing the problem of climate change, which would lead you to the conclusion that the people doing the most for climate change would be authoritarian governments and not democratic governments, because that is exactly the set of changes that this policy would enact. And yet if you look around, the countries that are doing the most for climate change are the most democratic nations where the people have the greatest say, where the market is the most free, not the nations where governments are in charge and are the most dominant, which is why they automatically lose, I guess, zero gets the second. Two things in extension. Firstly, why the free market is the optimal place to solve this problem. And secondly, why governments are terrible and we should do away with them for good. Firstly, on the market, we, we point out the core premise of the government bench case must be that the government is more efficient than the market in solving climate change. Obviously wrong for a series of reasons. Yeah. Do you think the Biden administration will be doing more than it currently is on climate change with less constraint by Congress? Uh, no. I think it would not be doing more on climate change if it was less constrained by this full set of policies which mean it had no reason to appeal to voters. Many of those voters demand these kinds of changes in the first place. That was the actual effect of this policy. It's not just making, like, you know, Biden less accountable to Congress, it makes Biden less accountable to the people who demanded the change in the first place. So, wrong. Why is the market really good at solving this problem? Firstly, the market reacts much faster. Think, for example, the way that environmental and social governance issues become the key issue on corporations in the last two years. Think the way that green investing is where the vast majority of money now goes on the stock exchange. Think the way that divestment from fossil fuels by large index funds and large investors like BlackRock, Fidelity, and State Street has resulted in basically every major oil corporation committing to net neutrality on carbon by 2050. It's led to Exxon and Shell falling from the Dow Jones Industrial Average when they used to be the largest companies in the world. It's led to some of the most aggressive targets coming from those companies, and it's raised the costs of the infrastructure projects and polluting from those companies so high that they are the, now the largest investors in renewable technology, far more than governments have ever done. Secondly, they're far better at innovation for a set of obvious reasons. One, they already have the built-in expertise and scientists and people and infrastructure set up to engage in innovative technologies. Secondly, their incentives are better aligned to 
produce the most innovative technology because they know how to efficiently allocate capital to a variety of different projects and they know when to cut their losses and like move away from one project towards another. Governments tend to get very committed to like one idea, like they invest a lot in hydrogen fuel cells, it doesn't work out, they've sunk a trillion dollars into it, so they just keep going. Corporations don't fall into that trap because they have profit incentives. But thirdly, corporations just have better incentives, right? Like the reason why divestment's occurring is because investors want long-term stability and lower risk over time. That is achieved by tackling the problem of climate change. That is a very direct incentive that affects the economic interests of every investor. Governments only care about climate change in so much that it affects their electability, considering there are a range of other issues that determine whether or not governments get elected or not, and considering they have a range of personal interests and priorities. They obviously care about the issue of climate change much less, which is why the most accountable governments are the ones which care about climate change, and the least accountable ones are the ones that care the least. So at the end of this point, that demonstrates why the market is likely to be incredibly better at this than the government, and therefore why this team, by reducing the capacity of the market to engage in that change, actually harms the capacity to tackle climate change. Second issue, why the government is easy. A couple of things to say here. The first thing is just to say that this is an unnecessary policy to achieve the vast majority of the benefits that this team sets out. We can already do things like implement an emissions trading scheme, a Gobi tax, or a carbon tax if we wanted to. We can already do things like find companies who like pollute rivers or engage in kinds of things that, that violate you know, emission standards and so on that already exist. We can build up more of those standards. There's obviously a large amount of political capital to do things like increase the quality of life for people by reducing environmental destruction that occurs immediately to them and affects their quality of life. Like, those things are easily done. And the reason they're not done right now is not because the government doesn't have sufficient power, it's because it has insufficient will to achieve those things. And that means that increasing the government's power does not change the extent to which those things occur. The second thing we point out, though, is just that the vast majority of pollution that occurs around the world is as a result of the government directly already, and they choose to do nothing about that. The largest oil companies in the world are things like Saudi Aramco, Rosneft, Petrobras, and Pemex, all owned by governments directly. If they wanted to cut emissions there, they could. They do not because they do not have the will to. It's things like the militaries of, like, the US military is the largest polluter in a world by an order of magnitude. They could cut those emissions if they wanted to. They choose not to. Governments already have the capacity to engage in this action. They have a very strong revealed preference for doing the exact opposite of what this team says. It is state-owned oil companies that pollute far more. It is state-owned oil companies that have not committed to net neutrality on carbon emissions by 2050. So if anything, they increase the capacity of those governments to engage in more pollution and more environmental destruction. The third and most important thing to say here, though, on the issue of governance is just, of course, they will fucking abuse the hell out of these powers for a set of very obvious reasons. This team says, uh, no, they won't because they're good, and even if they do, at least something occurs. One, no, they're not good, and two, ignoring the comparative that the market could have done a better job, but why will they abuse these powers? This team actually gives you the exact set of reasons, right? Because climate change is a long-term problem, it's constant, and it's hard to define, which means unlike a war where there's a clear conclusion where you must give up emergency powers, you can always point to a new environmental disaster to explain why you must keep those powers. Like 100 years ago, you'd say it was acid rain, then the population boom, and now you would say that it's things like climate change. There will always be another problem you can point to. You never need to give up those powers. Obviously, politicians never have an interest to reduce their own, uh, their own powers. What does that abuse mean like? Uh, look like? Three things. Firstly, huge amounts of corruption. Think about the way that like Cheney and Bush funneled billions of dollars to oil companies like Halliburton when they had power during the Iraq war. They'll obviously do similar things to like green companies owned by friends. It'll be incredibly inefficient, but incredibly costly to the taxpayer. Secondly, they give the media, like the government control of the media and allow them to ramp up mass surveillance. Think of a way that Bush weaponized the no-fly list, not journalists who criticized him out of being able to travel across the country. Now you have the power to crack down on any opposition, claiming that they're like anti-green or like lying about environmental environmental policy or something, in the same way that Xi Jinping weaponized anti-corruption measures to knock out his opposition, you now weaponize these measures. It means more things like the Patriot Act, it means cracking down on opposition, because governments have the incentive to do those things, and they can. Thirdly, and most importantly, this empowers authoritarian regimes, because obviously they're going to do bad stuff anyway, but now you can't criticize them, because they greenwash it and say, well, you're doing it too, you're also authoritarian, you also ignore the people, you also engage in policies without consultation, and they have plausible deniability to engage in things like human rights violations, appropriation of property, violation of patents, and so on, and nothing can be said. The end of this debate, the question you have to ask is very simple. Governments were so good at doing stuff, why were they the ones doing the least stuff?
just got up and gave like literally 20 reasons for why this is an appropriate method, only for Udai to tell you that, well, there's no incentive for governments. Because if you listen to the framing of Lulu's speech, you'll understand that firstly, like if it is the case that governments have very little incentive to actually do this, Firstly, it is the case that the instances where they will do this are instances where A, there is overwhelming domestic pressure to actually enact a policy, which is probably good, but they want to talk about the other instances. Secondly, in the instance of not democratic will, but international will, which is to say that every single year, there are a number of international treaties that are signed. Things like the Kyoto Protocol, things like the Paris Agreement. But the problem with those treaties is that they run into domestic intrigue, which is to say that countries pressure other countries into trying to lower their emissions, but they never do so because of the collective action problems Lulu talks about, but also because they have an excuse of not doing it because they can go back to their own country, have that policy be caught up in the Congress, caught up into legislation, caught up into all the political intrigues, caught up by corporate capture, which means that yes, there is that incentive for governments to do it because other countries use soft power and use sanctions to push those governments to lower their emissions, but they're able to bypass that and scapegoat that to domestic intrigue. On the outside, when they don't have those barriers anymore, there's far more pressure on them from other international actors to actually implement the things within those treaties. But thirdly, what we tell you is that there are a set of policies which are actually approved democratically by the people, but cannot be implemented in the status quo. Which is to say that currently, there are already laws which tell governments that they need to crack down on companies that do bad environmental crimes, but they can't do anything about it because those companies capture the government through lobbying, because those those companies are able to arbitrate and sue in court and argue about whether they can do things or not. And that's why we need the asset seizure policies that Lulu talks about. Because even when they get the democratic will to actually have the government do something, they can't do anything because the companies are far too powerful on their side. And that's why their side can't talk about our side being authoritarian because their side is a dictatorship of capitalism. Because companies, which are by far the most, most powerful actor within this debate, are able to influence these governments into inaction. That is the problem you guys need to solve and you guys haven't given us an adequate solution to do that. First, two issues in the speech. Firstly, is there another way? Secondly, about the effects. Firstly, is there another way? We tell you that the burden on their side is that they need a good alternative and they need that alternative to be implemented fast because they can't just say vague buzzwords like company incentives because climate change, as Lou describes, is a pressing emergency. And even though we describe it, it is like long term in the way that the problem is enacted. It only needs to be longer term than the four or three years of a government cycle for it to miss out on democracy. Which is to say that we tell you firstly, the degree of problem is so, so large. Which is why the POI that Unai gives about crime is absolutely farcical. Because obviously if crime was so bad, because crime is essentially individual people enact like revolting against government laws, right? If crime was so bad that it got to the degree of terrorism or it got to the degree of a state revolution, then obviously the government can enact emergency powers in that sense. But secondly, we tell you the nature of the problem. The fact that democracy fails under their side because it's being captured by companies because of short-term incentives. Not just in the fact that people have no incentive, that parties have no incentive to care about the environment because their impacts occur in the future, but also there's no accountability mechanism, which say that other policies, you're able to enact them and then when they fail 10 years down the track you can be like, well the Howard government fucked up when they sold out our companies off. But Lulu tells you the advanced analysis of the fact that pollution and climate change can't be attributed cleanly to individual actors and policies because of the fact that it is just an ominous cloud of drilling into ice cones and seeing, well shit, there's more pollution now than before. But you can't be like, well it's because of the 1972 US Act trade policy. But the next thing we tell you is that there is a um there is that collective action problem that that, that, that occurs, and they never solved this, but we solved it because we put direct policies that push people into doing things, that make companies do those things. What do they tell you? They say, well, companies can do this because companies are innovative, competent, and agile. And this is a demonstration of Udai being logically rigorous but intellectually dishonest because obviously companies have zero incentive to actually make that change. And to the degree at which they can make that change, they don't have the will to make that change because firstly, there is a first move a disadvantage in actually trying to turn to renewable because at the point at which you try to change to solar all the other companies are out competing you at the point at which you know they're still using carbon emissions but secondly companies don't need
need to do this because under the status quo, they have the ability to push back because of lobbying, because they can go to court and argue about these things and cost the state millions of dollars in legal fees, which I'm makes states me. reluctant and legislatures reluctant to actually prosecute this. And because of the fact that even though like companies and shareholders obviously care about the long term to some degree, the executives in charge of those companies have very short term incentives because they care about the bonuses that they have in those short terms and therefore actually want to make changes that get them there. Which means companies cannot do the job. Only our policy can. Like Billy can peel why all they want about like, oh, but why do you need to do this? But like actually give me a policy. Like what is your policy, guys? I'll, I'll take opening. Sure. If people want these policies, the government will do them now. If people don't want these policies, the electoral incentive to not do them still exists even if the government No, 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 no. See, this well, is a this is too much of a false dichotomy because they're like, either there's democratic will or there isn't. Our contention is more nuanced, which is that the democratic system has failed because the normal accountability systems of democracy fail in the fact of collective action problems. They fail in the fact of short-term incentives. They fail of the fact of the reluctance of the people and the lack of information there. Let's secondly talk about the facts. They tell us governments use this to become dictatorial. Obviously, there are a set of uh, you know, accountability mechanisms that mitigate this argument to a great extent. Firstly, you can obviously constitutionally challenge this in the same way that you would constitutionally challenge use of wartime powers. Secondly, the government as a whole can still be voted in and voted out after a short three-year term. And thirdly, I give you the framing where in the context where governments are likely to use this power much, they're likely to use it in the context of enacting environmental treaties. And because those environmental treaties are done internationally and done across a broad spectrum of actors, it's unlikely to be used politically well weaponized in a specific way, but also there is accountability overseas, because when other countries are using it in an actual way to reduce emissions, and X country is using it to like crack down on people being a dictator, like obviously that is ridiculous, because countries have to enact the way they do their policies in a relatively similar way. Then I says, well it's hard to define because there's always a problem, but firstly, there is a scope to define what exactly the problem is in the ta problem that you're ta tackling, like you can't just be violent on your side and randomly become a dictator, but lastly, even if there are some problems with accountability, at the end of the day, Lulu gives you the imperative that the environment was the most important thing. They say vague words like democracy, but they fail to prove that the democratic mechanism exists on their side or is actually important in any meaningful sense. For these reasons, we are very proud to have The DPM makes a kind of wacky strategic decision midway through that speech when he decides to emphasize that the problem right now is that governments are not accountable. That's really interesting because the significant part of their policy is censoring the media, is like delaying elections, presumably if they're going to solve short termism. If the problem is the government's unaccountable, then opposition bench is the side that wins this debate because we're the side that gets accountability. If it is the case that the public is behind these sorts of things, well, then they're going to be done. If the government is accountable, they're the ones that have the really big problem. I'll start this debate by talking about the comparative, then I'll talk about a point about this. This is undemocratic, then about how the market will solve climate change, then about tyranny, then fingers crossed, the point about civil unrest. Let's go. On the comparative, this is just a quick note that I'll probably get through quite quickly. There are two reasons why a government might adopt these sorts of wartime powers. The first is that they really support action on climate change and they just love solving climate change. In that case, the counterfactual for side opposition is that this is a government that's really activist, is one that's going to be doing great reforms to the market, is going to be passing like really good policies in order to deal with climate change. In which case the comparative is quite great, and we're getting all the problems, uh, we're, getting, we're solving all the problems that opening government identifies. The second reason that they might do this is because they are just opportunistic authoritarians, in which case the counterfactual is just not tyranny, and on their side, a government that simply seizes upon this is unlikely to actually do anything good. At this point, I think we've already won the debate. Moving on to why this is undemocratic, we would simply point to the fact that as citizens in democratic countries have a significant amount of their lives controlled by the government, and in many cases do not have a large amount of freedom. The government is able to lock them up, able to take their hard-earned uh, wages, etc. In that case, we can use uh, some power over the government, which side, gov or which side government denies. In that case, uh, and we think it's kind of legitimate for people to, for instance, deprioritize environmental issues if they care more about, say, like economic things, for instance, if you're like in quite a disadvantaged community. In this case, government bench has to defend stripping a large number of people of a large number of their civil rights, in which case we think they have a slightly higher burden to win this debate. Alright, let's move on to the media parts of this speech. First of all, the market solution to climate change. 
We think the market is going to solve this simply because it has every incentive to do so as the population becomes more and more conscious of this. Uday gave countless mechanisms, gave many, many well-researched examples of where it is in the status quo that we are getting increased regulation, increased uh, consumer action, a shareholder action to these companies. There is rapid change in recent years that as much as opening government might say we're like intellectually dishonest, I don't know, like they're uh, factually dishonest, I'm not sure. <laughs> they say that companies have no incentive to solve climate change. We think they do. For instance, if you're a solar panel manufacturer, you probably do want to solve climate change. But also, if you're in fossil fuels and your uh, like shareholders are telling you that there is no future in fossil fuels because regulation's coming, well, there's an incentive in moving to renewables, for instance. And they say there's a first mover disadvantage. But we think this only applies to governments rather than corporations, because if you're the one who moves first, you're the first one to get a patent and get a huge amount of money from your innovation. In that case, we think the market does have quite big reasons to solve this. But maybe government bench is correct in pointing out that there are, for instance, certain market failures. Because, for instance, there is an instance of like a first mover problem, or short termism, etc. But these are only arguments for government action, rather than governments overstepping what the constitution sets out as, as what they can do. And we think the government can do good things on side of opposition. That is, they can make do measures that make the market more transparent. They can, for instance, subsidize certain in, like uh, infant industries. They can do things like competing in taxes, etc. Our side government says there are problems, for instance, corporate capture. But on either side, the government is captured. It's not like the government is handcuffed and it wants to escape. The government is very happy being captured by corporations because they're getting paid heaps of cash by corporations. In this case, what we most need to keep corporate capture under, under control is accountability, which only side opposition gets you. So on their side, they're silencing the press and they're withholding elections. Then they say that the first mover problem, that is literally the same on both sides, uh, so we are ahead on that, but then they say there's a problem with short-termism. Not the only way for them to really solve this is, for instance, by delaying elections, but we think if you have a government that is insulated from the cost of elections because they are able to silence the media to a certain extent, because they are able to, for instance, postpone elections, in that case, uh, they're going, that sort of allows to be short-term, but there's no one holding them to account. So we think the market is quite well equipped to actually deal with these problems, or at least a market plus likely government regulations that are going to happen on our side, which actually are quite likely for reasons that we recognize. Moving on to tyranny. Basically, we said governments will abuse powers. So they want to keep them, because the government wants to keep power, yeah, but also they're able to keep them. That's because they, there's no real well-defined end to this crisis, but also because there are simply lacking accountability measures. Opening government says, well, actually, you can define when climate change is. Like, not really. Like, the threat's always going to be there, right? And there's also other crises you can divert your attention to. A good example of this is the Joint Strategic Op or Joint Special Operations Command, which was set up, or, and like the, the drone program under Obama, which might have ostensibly been a good idea at the start, but was so opaque, was so insulated from any sort of accountability measures, that they were just able to, able to go on, get worse, and never be held to account. So it is the case that governments will keep these powers and will abuse them, and moreover, later governments that inherit these powers will be able to use and abuse them. But before that, I'll take a close. Do you think Australian voters, when they go to the polls, think about the people who care about who will vote for them? Um, no, but, oh, actually, no, wait a second, they definitely do, because people care about climate change. Also, um, okay, sorry, I'll quickly do tyranny, then I'll move on to my stuff. So basically the problems with governments having power that they can abuse is, first of all, you have governance problems, where you have less trust in government, more corruption, worse governance on the whole. Second of all, it makes other governments worse, because one country implementing these sorts of wars will give justification to other countries to do these sorts of things. Third of all, it makes climate change response worse because there's no accountability on the government. If they're doing their job really shittily, who's going to stop them? That's why tyranny gets so much worse and it leads to the abuse of citizen civil rights. Last of all, on civil unrest. In the status quo, many people support action on climate change and many people are happy to go along with reasonably strong government responses. But what happens under this policy is they implement quite radical changes, things that will inflict an economic cost, things that will take jobs from a lot of people, and things that happen by bypassing free speech, bypassing the media, and bypassing the houses, like by legislative houses. And the result of this is that any sort of changes that happen seem quite illegitimate. People don't support it. People actually come to oppose climate change. And this is what happens when you do things undemocratically. For instance, you get things like the Yellow Vest protests in France. What this means is, one, you simply are at risk of losing function of government. But second of all, it's really bad for action on climate change because what it does is it forces the government to repeal policies. Ultimately, at the end of this, the government can't go too far beyond what the population wants. Because if that happens, there'll be unrest, the government will get booted out. If the government does these policies and is tyrannical, the population will be less willing to support climate change policies, 
which means that like, the government can't actually do these policies anyway. When Pelosi and government said the Biden administration is constrained, like, come on, they're constrained also by the limits of civil unrest. At the end of this speech, we think the market is able to solve this. Australians actually do care about climate change, but if you give the government the means to silence all opposition, they're not going to do anything, they're going to stop the market from doing what it would do, and they're just going to lead to a general mess, long-term problems, that's why we oppose. Well, I think opposition are right in a lot of things they say in this debate. It is true that climate policy will only pass the critical mass of people wants it to pass, but the issue under the status quo is the critical mass do not want. Firstly, because they have insufficient information. Secondly, because they are self-interested. That was a harm. That was one that was directly analogous to war. Was the precise reason why these measures need to be taken put in place. Secondly, it was true that the free market may solve things like climate change in the future, but as Mark alludes to in his very speech, at the point the free market solves these issues, they also then have the right to patent those solutions, profit exorbitantly and extraordinarily off them, precluding the rest of the world from actually advancing as a consequence. We are going to win this debate as opposing government by directly analogising the climate emergency to war in a way the working government does not even go close to. We are going to show firstly that things that are paramount in the context of a war is the global good. Secondly, the profit is always secondary to solutions which are more likely to be born under our side using the same measures that are talked about at length at working position. Three points of extension then from closing government. Firstly, why the climate emergency is for war, and why prima facie that gives governments the entitlement to enact wartime powers. Secondly, why this is a necessity to the developing world, particularly sinking countries in the Pacific and coastal countries in West Africa. And thirdly, why the instrumentality of government is only useful at the point where they can implement wartime powers. Firstly, on why this is a war, noting an important piece of framing to begin. If we can prove that the climate emergency is sufficiently similar to a war, or at least sufficiently similar to the circumstances that have led to governments implementing wartime powers in the past outside of wartime context, then they have a prima facie in order to right to utilise these powers. And this is interesting because OG don't actually do this. They never actually suggest the climate emergency is a war or something that justifies wartime powers, rather they just say it's particularly hard. Five reasons this is something that is tantamount to war. Firstly, the potential death toll is extraordinarily and directly analogous to those of wars. It could number in the millions, and note that it's also something that is globally burdened, not necessarily one that just impacts each individual country. Secondly, this is an issue that requires collective actions, which OD, OG largely assert will give the more specific metric, but insofar as it requires collective actions, it requires the movement of individuals from at-risk areas, it requires people to be, to, be, to be displaced from the jobs they presently work into other areas. Thirdly, it presents unique technological and scientific challenges in the same way arms races in wars do. And note that at the point where you have the capacity uniquely using these wartime powers to direct workforce for labour that otherwise focus that would otherwise focus on their private endeavours, as working opposition talk about, you can harness the energy that would otherwise go into the solutions that they suggest and actually get them beneficially. But fourthly, and uniquely will provide that in the context of war you have an obligation to allies, countries that voters when they vote in democracies wouldn't necessarily care about, but rather in the context context of a war, you probably care more about things historically such as the empire, or currently things like allies that you owe an obligation to. Fifthly, as well, and crucially in response to such that o -O, a lot of the things that o, o says, at the point where you have a war, you have the capacity to commandeer resources that are being produced in the private sphere if those solutions are particularly useful. You have the capacity to do things like disregard the patents that might solve issues of climate change that would otherwise be shackled by private corporations only used to the extent that it can generate them a profit, a profit which is likely to be tenuous under their side anyways. Note then that after those five pieces of analysis, if you believe that this is sufficiently similar to a war, it is legitimate to implement these powers. Crucially, it need not be entirely analogous, because it's not as though wartime powers are only exclusively ever implemented in the context of wars. You can also see things that are talked about in other points of this debate, like domestic terrorism, where wartime powers are also enacted, like the amorphous war on terror that is allowed you know, the government to, think, to do things like the Patriot Act, as is talked about by opening opposition. Meaning that if you think there's at least a sufficient nexus of similarity between war or, or the things that have been similar, similarly used to justify wartime powers beforehand and climate change, they have a right to use these powers. Consequently then, we have invented a new casus belli that allows these uh, countries to declare war on climate change. And this wins our debate, this wins us the debate and goes past that which opening talks about. Because note, crucially, and this disregards a lot of the material that opening opposition talks about, 
The Kassai's ballet can only be invoked where a bona fide or genuine effort is made to actually remedy the issue. This, this is not as though the Trump presidency, because they wanted to do things in an autocratic fashion, could just declare war on fucking nobody, I don't know, and then pass a lot of these policies in a particularly egregious right way. Rather, you're only able to do things like get past the Supreme, Supreme Court, enact these wartime powers, where you can show you're going to make a bona fide effort to actually correct issues, meaning the only governments that will ever have the right to enact these policies are the governments that are likely to actually be able to target climate change, that are actually likely to be making a difference. That was crucial because of the analogy to war. That's why I win this debate. Second extension I want to talk about is why the developing world, because a CO point of information initially points out, and Mark talks a lot in their speech about how democracy is something particularly important, and what I think they'll win this debate on like a one liner, which is, well, if enough people wanted these sorts of policies, the government would just pass these policies because they'd have, you know, uh, you know, rights to do such, ignoring a lot of the responses that OG give that are relatively strong, such as, you know, obstructionism in Congress, but moreover, it's worth noting, the people with capital or capacity to move in the case of coastal countries like Australia particularly, who can probably up and move at the point where the coast actually gets high enough, probably don't care sufficiently for the allied countries that we would care about in the context of war. That is, you hey, don't give a fuck about Kiribati. You don't care about Tuvalu. You don't care about Tokelau because it doesn't affect your hip pocket. It doesn't affect your bottom line because you as an individual have capacity to subvert those issues because like elections are never just decided on the basis of climate change in and of itself. Rather, there is a multitude of other issues all to be a higher priority. Only at the point where this is analogised to a wartime situation do you actually care about your allies in a way that's sufficient. Only then you're able to protect coastal African and Pacific countries that you otherwise wouldn't open it. Sure. Your case relies on the premise that wartime powers are justified. We'd say turning the Japanese, breaking up unions and jailing conscientious objectors are immoral and not justified. That is reliant on the fact that using wartime powers in the context of fucking war is in and of itself unjustified. And sure it is true that wartime powers have often been used to justify abysmal actions, but they've also been used to do things like fucking end wars, which is probably a more, like a way, way, way fucking larger benefit than the harm that's associated with Japanese internment camp. A lot of those things as well you can correct after the fact for things like reparations, fucking stupid POI. Final thing in extension is to talk about the instrumentality of government. I know that opening government does some work here, so far as they talk about democratic deadlocks, they talk about the difficulty passing Congress, the Supreme Court, campaign finance, etc. We'll provide you the unique analysis that government teams in this or opposition teams in this debate never proved that democracy is actually a particularly useful thing, and that is a particularly important contribution. Because firstly, in the context of democracies, voters are often extraordinarily misinformed. Secondly, as we've talked about, they're often nationalistic, ignore our allies in ways that are important. But thirdly, ignore the reality that's been occurring. That is to say that in the last decade, the country has done the most to correct climate issues has been China, and there's no small part to the fact that this is a country that, although autocratic, is able to pass policies that immediately correct things and look forward to the future. Note at the end of this speech then, at the point where you give governments a unique castle spell life, it can only be implemented when they're making a genuine bona fide effort to actually correct climate change. And when it's directly analogised to war, it bypasses the issues with democracy, is more likely as well to resolve in solutions, less likely to resolve in patented technologies that fix the world, is more likely to end climate change. That's why we win. Starting in three, two, one. I wrote this is a really bad idea cheap on my brainstorm paper, sure, and I still stand by it. Uh, because this is a terrible idea. Government teams have not actually proved this is similar to war. They have not proved this practically would have anywhere near the same benefit as war. They haven't proved that this outcome is as urgent as what is required, for example, for you to be able to pass this sort of legislation, which is why you have war and stuff based on urgency. And they have not proved that climate change policy cannot happen in other worlds, obviously given that this is a very high threshold for this debate. So we're going to do three things. First, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about which stakeholders we're talking about, because I feel like it's gone a little bit confusing. Then I'm going to talk about why this is totally immoral and totally different to war. And then I'm going to talk about why you don't get left-wing parties in power, therefore mitigating any sort of future benefit to climate change in the future. Let's first talk about why this is totally illogical. Obviously, uh, this debate has to be with uh, countries or with uh, governments that are somewhat wanted to be put in place this sort of power, because obviously this debate is relevant. It's not super about the authoritarian stuff that opening opposition want to talk about. It's probably about you know governments that are broadly, vaguely left wing, or at least have been in power that are left wing, but are not, for example, able to maybe pass policy. The problem with this then is let's look at the things they say that they think this government could be useful to do. Things like saying there is a crisis, which we can obviously support. Things like actively, you know, trying to pass policy that is helpful. All things we can actively do. And at the point when you have a majority in government, they have to prove that this would not be able to succeed otherwise. And the mechanism from David is, but corporations have controlled the government, which is an exact reason that this left-wing government wouldn't pass the policy of either side. Yeah, they would not declare this sort of thing to be, uh, you know, they wouldn't declare uh, try and pass this policy because governments have control. So this must be a left-wing government that is in 
a level of delay. Yeah, maybe there is enough sort of backloading that it just takes a while for these things to get in power. That is maybe the most charitable reading of this. And then the question is, if it just takes you, for example, a year to pass emissions policy as opposed to, you know, three days, is it worth subverting the entire will of the people and democracy? And that is why we're going to prove it's probably totally immoral to do that. So, why is this actually like the king to, for example, when you see power in war? Five reasons why it is not. Let's first look at Sweeney's uh, very bad analysis of why this is like war. His first thing is he's like, oh, but a lot of people die, chief. And that's not enough reason to justify it. For example, Switzerland did not go to war despite the fact that the people around it, because it was like, it would be bad for my people who I have an obligation to. Yeah, because you have a bigger obligation to your people than you do to random people elsewhere. For example, they pay tax to you. For example, you are like, you know, like they are the ones who are like subject to your crimes, to your laws, to your orders. They're the ones who directly voted for you to do things in the interest of them. So you saying we should do things in the interest of other people and not us is probably pretty fucking undemocratic. You should not decide to do things in the interest of other people who aren't the people you're voting for. That seems to actually subvert democracy quite considerably. But we said the second thing is the reason why it actually, for example, has to be in war you're allowed to do this is for the reason that it's incredibly quick, yeah? You need a huge amount of pass of budget in the next five days to be able to expand the war that you've, the, the, like the people that have just decided to attack you. All those sort of things means you have to do it very quickly to be able to amass a lot of control, to do it like to be able to pass this policy so that you guys aren't defeated. And that obviously then extends to having an obligation to the broader population there. But that has to prove the same level of urgency exists and neither team have. You do not have the same level of urgency in the climate change crisis, for example, because if you reduce your emissions in a year, it's probably likely you can have a relatively similar impact. The emissions are relatively down with COVID. We think that you can probably pass this stuff in a relatively easy way then. But the second thing to say is we think that uh, the public opposition for this is likely to be incredibly uh, important in climate change debates in a way that war they do not. For example, you control the media in war because you need to get people to enlist. You need to get people to be able to control the media so the narrative of war is one that is like sentimental to you and supportive. The opposite problem exists under our side, where if you do, for example, silence the criticism, what you do is destroy left-wing parties. Because here's the problem. The criticism comes from when you guys seize the minds and ruin, for example, and take people out of jobs. You take people out of the jobs that you promised you would not take them out of. You ruin, for example, all the mining companies, like, like, like countries, like people who exist in those areas. And then you make it incredibly hard to ever get those people on side for you in the future. And that is probably incredibly immoral because you've totally ruined the things that you've decided to campaign on. And that is probably something that people care about. But the second thing to say is we think that also uh, you need to probably act in the interest of your own people. And at the point when they do not want this policy to pass, it doesn't matter if you as a government believe there's a principal obligation, you have a higher obligation and threshold to your people, then that sort of thing. The final thing that Sweeney says, he said like, but oh, you know, you've got an obligation to like other allies. No, you don't. The US only went to war when they were bombed by Pearl Harbor. They weren't like, oh, the UK is having something. I now have an obligation to intervene. People have an obligation to prioritize their own citizens first, and this actively ruins it, especially when you're subverting the will of the people. I don't know when it is the will of the people. I think the government has the capacity to get it in. David's like, oh, but you can't get it in. This makes no sense, David. First, obviously at the point where maybe you have to negotiate and get a slightly watered down version of a policy, that is horrible. But that does not mean you cannot pass this policy. It just means this policy takes a while to get in, or maybe is slightly less strong. But that is probably comes with the benefits that we sort of point to. The next, I want to talk about why left wing parties are now absolutely fucked. First thing, the risk now is of the parties that are likely to seize this power yet, which is parties that are left wing as government teams point to. And now then, the conservatives are able to run on the campaign that the people who are most likely to seize power are left wing governments. That is incredibly powerful for people who are afraid, for example, of people losing power. But second, it makes them just less popular broadly, which is incredibly hard to mass capital. David, go. Um, companies push back in the status quo because they can. On our side, the mere threat of getting shut down gives an incentive for companies to proactively shift to renewables regardless this of what government is in. So I think this is kind of cool, but it makes no sense. Because we can say, we as a left-wing government are actively going to shut down companies in our policy, yeah? And then you have the exact same incentive. Maybe it might take a little bit longer, but you're still able to get the incentive of like, we're going to change companies, we're going to try and do that. And also, it's in companies' interest to like, uh, you know, be renewable in the future. Okay, now then let's talk about left-wing parties. The next thing I want to say is that we think that right-wing parties are the ones that are considered bad, yeah? They're the ones more likely to do things like encroachment in media. They're the ones more likely to be slightly authoritarian. But now you've ruined that left-wing, for example, balance. 
Trump was saying that the media is being controlled by Biden, and now when Biden sees the media, he's absolutely able to buy into all of the fucking Republic rhetoric that the right and the left wing are the ones who control the media. All those sort of things make it incredibly bad because you are unable to, for example, get swing voters on your side later. It makes it worse than partnership in a lot of these places and destroys people's belief that the left wing party are the ones that believe in democracy, who are more, who are more like more democratic, more willing to listen to the people. And that's bad not just for climate change. It's bad for police policy. It's bad for minorities. It's bad for black people in America. It's bad for LGBT people in pretty much every country. Like the left wing parties will now be destroyed. The campaigns will be awful, but also now they will be the ones for exactly the authoritarian people they were running in criticism of. That is an absolutely disastrous case. This was an immoral policy that was going to ruin, for example, left wing rights and ruin environmental movements broadly. So proud of the folks. in this debate is that the opposition is defending the status quo, which means that as much as they want to criticise us for like ineffectiveness or not dealing with the will of the people, they are defending the status quo when that equally happens. They cannot pretend that they get like amazing democracy and amazing um, like you know pe people getting their say in parliament on their side of the debate. Um, two main reasons why we win, and then I'll engage with each of the teams or three of them. First, so the, of the two main of the two reasons we win this case. Firstly, it's because we're the only team that engages with the topic in terms, in terms of that this is a war. We're the only team that proves to you why this is analogous to a war and therefore should be treated as such. Secondly, the, we're the only team that focuses on developing nations and why we all prioritise them. This is because they are the most impacted by climate change. They are the least able to enact change. Under the opposition, the status quo continues. These nations continue to suffer and they do nothing about this. So um, now in terms of, um, now I'll engage with CO, why we need CO. Um, okay, Billy brings us two main pieces of extension. Firstly, that a government owe a responsibility to their people to like act. And secondly, that this really screws with left-wing left governments, people view them really badly. Six main responses to this first um, extension about that, um, that, that governments owe a responsibility to their country. Firstly, it's largely derivative of their opening. Secondly, we think it is legitimate, this is a really important one, right? We think it is le legitimate to subvert democracy when it is in the global interest, when, it, when you are dealing with things as significant with death tolls that climate change is. It, is. it is legitimate to subvert democracy then. Thirdly, we thought the populace is largely misinformed, so you, you may owe responsibility to these people, but they may not know like, what the actual issues are. Fourthly, we thought that the opposition, when they um, when they deal with these issues, they are ignoring the inhibitions that exist in our current government system. They are ignoring how fucking difficult it is to get any legislation through Australian Parliament. When you have to go through the Senate and the Upper House, you have to engage with cross-bench senators, cross senators, all that kind of stuff. Um, they are ignoring all those difficulties. Fifthly, we thought this analysis is not really unique, given things that the Patriot Act exist that the government already like screws with their authority and are willing to like subvert democracy in a lot of situations. The media is already censored by corporate donors who like um, decide what CNN will publish and decide what different companies will focus on. This is not something that's unique to outside the opposition has to defend it to. And sixthly, the opposition says under this point that we don't owe anything to allies. I think the first thing to say is then, just like, why the fuck did America, did Australia join any war ever? Like World War II, Iraq, any of them. Why did we get involved if we owe nothing to our allies? The second thing to say here is that we currently have like a um, an agreement with America. That if Australia is invaded, like they legally have to come and defend us, so they do owe us something like under international law. In terms of the second um, uh, thing extension Billy brings us. And this is that it really screws with left-wing governments. Three responses to this. Firstly, and po possibly most importantly, we think this is a really worthwhile trade-off if they are perceived, um, if it allows these people to actually act. We are happy for these people to be viewed worse if it allows them to actually engage in positive change relating to climate change. Secondly, we thought that um, look, like a significant number of people do care about climate change. So they are still going to vote in favour of these left-wing parties. People are still going to believe their stances on issues. People are not suddenly going to like vote Republican or anything. Um, and thirdly, we think this is actually, in a way, it's a benefit for left-wing governments because they're perceived as strong and useful. One of the big criti biggest criticisms of left-wing governments in Australia, like the Greens, is that they do fucking nothing. They like they are literally unable to get anything through Parliament, get more than like one seat in the House at all. If they were actually able to enact change, it would make people vote for them because they would see that their vote actually mattered. They could actually, um, yeah, like their vote actually counted. It could help to enact change. 
Um, so I think that's why we beat um, closing opposition. Because their first point is largely derivative and I think we prove why our side is more beneficial. I will now deal with um, um, opening opposition. I think there are three main reasons why we need opening opposition. Firstly, Sweeney proves that the government, why the government will only do this to enact positive change, um, which deals with their point that like the government sucks and author authoritarian regimes will abuse power. Secondly, I think the idea that Rio Tinto is like the good guy in this debate is just like fucking ridiculous, and I'll deal with that in a second. And thirdly, they do not prove that popular support for climate change exists in the population. That is to say that as Sweeney says, um, voters are selfish and they care about things like tax cuts and having jobs much more than they do about analogous far away things like climate change. Um, three main responses to opening opposition. Firstly, on the idea that the market is better on action and investment. I think the main response to say to this is that the market has a direct incentive to exploit the environment. But Rio Tinto did not blow up Duke and Gorge because it was good for climate change or renewable energy. Because they thought there was a fuck ton of like, I don't know what it is, like iron ore there that they could make heaps of money from. So they just blew it up because that's what they do. The government is somewhat accountable to the people in terms of like elections and all that stuff. The market only cares about money, which means sure, if renewable energy is the financially <coughs> better alternative, they will engage in renewable energy. But the second exploitation becomes financially more viable and cheaper, they will switch to that immediately. Um, uh, and, 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 and on this issue, uh, we thought we think this is also particularly bad for the developing world, considering this is usually where like all these materials are reaped out of, that it's their workers who are underpaid and abused. Um, before I get on to my second response, I will take closing. Yeah, sure. The phrase about 1% of the vote, say they get in power for four years and are super undemocratic, they will never get in and the right of government to just undo all their stuff. Surely that's a really long-term harm. What's that again? Sorry. Like the, uh, if the left-wing party is in power, they'll be in power for a short time and then never again, so the long-term harm will be quite bad. But isn't the alternative just that like the, the right-wing party is just always in power? Like at least you get one term with the Greens where they can kind of enact something. You build a bit of a base where the populace is like, oh, the Greens actually like fucking did something. That's great. I'll go vote for them. Anyway, I don't think that's a big issue in this debate. Secondly, in response to opening opposition, they tell us that the government sucks. Um, oh, yes. Sweeney's already, uh, Sweeney's already rebutted those issues of why the government sucks. I think the final issue to deal with here on opening opposition is this idea of giving power to the people. Because they never actually prove that popular support for this policy exists. We think voters are incredibly selfish, that when like, you know, your parents go to the polls, they care about the stability of their jobs, they care about tax cuts. That is like people are inherently selfish and care about like having more money for themselves. They do not care about analogous things and particularly in a world like Sydney, climate change seems far away and often like, yeah, like really, really far away and unimportant to your daily life. Really quickly, finally, why we beat OG. Firstly, it's because we proved the government would only do this to enact positive change, which was something they struggled with in the opening clash. Secondly, we proved this situation is analogous to law. And thirdly, it gives you the reason, the fancy word, pass the spell I, to declare war. For all those reasons, that's why we come out on top today, um, because we prove why this is a war, and we prove the benefits to developing countries in particular that you all care about. Thank you. Thanks to all the government bench for their speech. Look, at the very least, this debate's a pretty clear off bench win. So I'm going to start this quick speech by explaining why our extension gets up over opening opposition. I think that side of opening opposition has such a hard on for the invisible hand of the market that they completely miss the biggest reason why we ought not to do this policy. Because I think their big claim is, well, the incredibly defensive, there's no reason to do this because corporations will already fix it. And the incredibly obvious one about how it gives authoritarian governments a way to grab power, which, while true, is very low impact. Because insofar as an authoritarian government wanted to grab power, they just do it with regular wartime powers anyway. What we say that gets over them is that, firstly, this actively harms the environmentalist movement by making it far less likely that people want to vote in environmentalist politicians because it's going to be seen as a power grab, because it becomes highly politicized. Conservatives will say this is big government gone insane and use it to completely get rid of any incentive to elect left-wing parties. That the usually left-wing and liberal voter base isn't going to want to vote in a political party, which is literally invoking an incredibly, you know, authoritarian, you know, political action in order to get their aims. Additionally, I think we give a high, we take a higher burden than side of the opposition in explaining how, regardless of outcomes, this is an incredibly immoral and undemocratic action. I think that the response that we get, which comes out of the side closing government, is threefold. But I don't think any of the three prongs are particularly compelling. The first is to say, well, maybe it's not immoral because the alternative is an incredibly high death toll as a result of climate change. But what we tell you is that this is a death toll that is speculative, unlikely to happen, and if it does happen, very far into the 
future. And it usually even go broad to empower us because there is urgency. We say that even if there is, you know, for example, a high death toll, the fact that we have hundreds of, like, you know, decades in order to be able to deal with this policy, which we probably ought not invoke this incredibly undemocratic measure. The second thing I say is, well, people are uninformed, so we shouldn't allow, you know, democracy to deal with it, which I think is mostly probably not true. People are incredibly informed, I think, about climate change. So why maybe 10 years ago the majority of the population didn't believe it existed. But now, basically 99% of people do. Mass turnout for climate rallies, environmentalist politicians are getting elected all over the globe. You only have to look at examples like the USA, for example, to see that. I think the last thing they say is, well, maybe you have to get concessions through democracy, through like a crossbench, for example. Which seems like it doesn't really add up to, well, therefore we need to completely subvert, subvert democracy. I think side opening opposition, you know, I'm convinced they know a lot about like Exxon Mobil and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but I'm not convinced they give the best reasons why we all want to do this. So now let's deal with the side, uh, side government in this, in this debate. Let's start with side opening government. So the team, they got five extra minutes of prep time, but still didn't manage to come up with a case. I think the obvious first problem with side opening government, uh, which we point out, is that you know, if there are reasons why it is very hard to deal with climate change, those would also be reasons why it is very hard for a political party to get wartime powers enacted, which means that there is insane amounts of political capital for us to get, you know, climate change policy passed on outside. I think the second problem with OG is that many of the premises that they give just don't make sense. So like, firstly, they say political parties are too short-termist. Obviously not true. Political parties don't want to be branded as a political party that let climate change destroy and ruin our quality of life. They are long-termist. Secondly, they say, well, there are collective action problems, but for every Paris agreement which fails, there is a Montreal Protocol which completely saves us from, for example, for, uh, uh, CFC emissions and holes in the ozone layer. They say, well, people pass on blame with the hot potato effect. I think this is just like some rhetoric, unclear specifically what this means. I think it is permanently under-explained. Fourthly, they say voters don't care because they are often self-interested. I think I've already dealt with this earlier on when I talked about and said people who care about climate change. And lastly, they say, well, you need to get concessions for conservatives. Again, something I've talked about earlier on. Political party is powerful enough to be able to literally introduce war powers. They're not going to care about concessions from independent, uh, those, those people. The last independent benefit that they try to whip for a point of information is to say, well, maybe this creates incentives for all, all corporations to want to go green because they don't want to be the one that these war powers are directed towards. Um, look, there are already incentives for, for corporations to do things like invest in renewable energy and solar energy because it is renewable into the long term, very cheap. But as Billy points out, these, are, these companies are already scared they're going to get targeted through legislation. We have sufficient time to be able to regulate these companies. I don't think this is enough to excite opening government. Um, but if they do have a point on thing, uh, the people are marching on the street, the imperative is there, but your side is captured by corporations. How do you free the political deadlock on your side? But, like, it is governments that are captured by corporations, and it is also governments doing this policy. If the government was captured by corporations, it wouldn't have to invoke war powers. It's kind of unclear that happens. Maybe you, you mean, like, you know, corporations, you know, like, control departments or whatever. In that case, we just reform those departments. Like, unclear how that wins them. Lastly, I'll talk about side closing government, uh, or like the, the rare Sweeney and Annabelle donor. Um, I think we we'll firstly talk about the first thing that they tell us, which is that this is very analogous to wartime. I think the big problem is that it's insufficient to just list reasons why it's similar to war. They additionally have to explain that the reasons why it is similar to war necessitate the imposition of wartime power specifically, and that said, this would have broad practical benefit. There are probably instances that are you know analogous to war where we don't you know, just automatically invoke wartime powers, right? Um, additionally, though, I think we explain it really why it's not analogous to war, because firstly, wartime often, uh, you know, we invoke powers because there is a sense of urgency, there is an immediate person at our doors that we need to deal with, and we explain that urgency doesn't exist. But that secondly, many of these powers that sort of being government sets up, like the need to control the media, don't really, you know, like, the, they have the opposite effect of dealing with climate change, which you limit this course and limit the ability to have deliberative policy. The last thing which side closing government gives us are developing world impacts. I'll take you know if you've got one. Obama was introducing the major trade of capital in West Africa, where you can write for crisis. How long do you think we actually realistically have to act? Uh, a few things. If that is the case, then those actions are like we we're already too far gone and no nothing you can do can stop that. But secondly, I don't think that is the case. Like there are things that we could do to stop the acceleration of um, you know uh, Waters rising, stuff that we're supporting, like governments going in and doing things like imposing climate taxes and those sorts of uh, measures. 
last thing they say is about developing world uh, impacts. I don't think that developing world impacts are likely to do enough to get them ahead in this debate. For the reason that it seems firstly uh, unclear specifically how much carbon emissions are coming out of these developing world countries. It seems secondly unclear as to why developing world countries would prioritise getting rid of like decreasing carbon emissions, but presumably they would need it to some extent to industrialise. Kind of unclear how that works. But then lastly, I feel like this uh, falls victim to the usual problem that developing world country extensions have, which is specifically which countries are we talking about? You need to explain what these countries look like and why specifically it works for them. I hear the word China being brought up, which probably doesn't make much sense in this debate, considering this is a country which is very clearly an example for side opposition, given the amount of, you know, for example, carbon tax legislation which is currently being pushed through in China. For these reasons, very charged